lights in other cities because they're protecting themselves. You know, they're afraid that that car didn't see them and they're going to, you know, turn right out looking. Absolutely. So it is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not justifying running red lights. Uh, people are taking care of themselves, so they're going to roll through the red light in order to be ahead of those cars that are coming up behind. Um, but once you create an infrastructure that is well designed, people behave. Um, once you encourage the mainstream uh, to ride bicycles, they just want to go to work quickly. So they will, you know, that's what you see here. It's just regular citizens, you know. Once you, once you broaden the, uh, the demographics of who's cycling in the city, people start behaving. And infrastructure as well. I like I always say, we don't have any cyclists in Copenhagen, we just have a lot of people who use bicycles, bicycle users. In many countries, it's a, a fetish object for like a, a variety of subcultures, you know, they, they love their bicycles, they polish them and all, and that's great, but um, but here, it's a workhorse, it's a tool, like a vacuum cleaner. Um, the so, Danes are into practicality. Absolutely, you know, and uh, if, your bike, if your bike gets stolen or if it you know, falls apart, you might get it repaired or you might just buy a new one. In Denmark, every year we scrap 400,000 bicycles and we buy 500,000 new, and so we don't, we we don't take it very seriously. Some people have nice bikes. We spend more on our bikes than any other country in the world. But um, you know, it's just a bike. Il n'y a pas que l'utilisation extrême du vélo qui soit unique à Copenhague. Il y a aussi l'audace de son architecture. C'est peut-être parce que Copenhague était la ville du grand architecte Arne Jacobsen qu'il y a ici une concentration d'architectes deux fois plus élevée qu'ailleurs dans le monde. Le résultat en est fort impressionnant. L'utilisation de l'espace est intelligente, le paysage est fascinant et tout gravite autour du fonctionnalisme. Jacob Lang et la firme Big Architects sont responsables de certains des projets les plus innovateurs de la ville. C'est d'eux que vient l'idée d'installer un complexe de piscine publique directement dans les eaux du port. Tell me how warm is the water today? Uh, <laughs> I, I would, or how cold is it? <laughs> you know, I would probably guess around 15 degrees today. Um, so uh, you, you're not going to get me inside. But, uh, you didn't bring your swimsuit? No. The main idea is that the lifeguard tower is sitting in the center of the harbor bath. So all the different uh, areas of the bath itself is sort of oriented uh, with sort of from this directional point so that they have a clear overview of everybody swimming at the same time. Uh, one of the things, you're, you're not allowed to, to swim in the harbor where you still have ships and so on. That's why uh, we need to have a designated area for the swimmers. Is there a way to describe Danish architecture? At the moment, uh, Copenhagen has a very sort of strong pool of, uh, of young and very ambitious architects that are trying to push the boundaries of what you normally do. We try to be a part of that group uh, to, to sort of help shape the surroundings around us and make the city that we want to live in. And the new marries well with the old? You know, it's all about contrast, basically. If you have a, an old church and a, and a new building next to it, if you try to look like the old church, then, you know, then it's just going to be, I don't know. You have to shape it differently and create the contrast between the new and the old. And that's what becomes strong architecture. Is Copenhagen a playing field for modern architects? We have had sort of a tradition for, for that the city architect is, is only there to make sure that the architecture that you build is pushing boundaries and, and is becoming a reality. When we design a, a piece of architecture, we always try to sort of give something back to the city. So this is a, sort of a classic example of, of trying to give as much space as we can back to the city. And maybe that's sort of the attitude of Copenhagen. We are designing a power plant where the entire uh, roof scape of the, the building is going to be one big ski hill. So a hundred meter tall ski hill, uh, almost in the center of Copenhagen, where everybody from, uh, from Copenhagen go, can go and ski. Uh, and of course, we don't have that much snow uh, in Denmark. So uh, in summertime, we have this fabric on the, on the roof itself, where you can uh, summer ski all year round in bikinis, if you like. <laughs> Sustainability has always been a very big part of the Danish architecture business. Uh, we have some very, very strong demands uh, in uh, written that we need to follow. And so, so it's also something that every architect in Denmark has grown up with. Uh, so of course it is a, a, a big thing uh, in every project that we do. On se dirige vers Urestad, un nouveau quartier, développé autour d'un train sans conducteur. 
Mais nous, on s'y rend évidemment à vélo. Tell me about Orestad. Is that the place of tomorrow? It's a new part of town, and I think as every new part of town, it will take some years before it get it really gets sort of uh, atmosphere and and, uh, and everything. It's mainly people that want to experience something new, that want to try to live not as everybody else, but uh, that are open to uh, to something uh, extraordinary. Ici, on se permet absolument tout, dans la mesure où la fonction des lieux sert la population. Mountain dwellings, la montagne, en est un excellent exemple. You have a, a parking house underneath that is then sort of acts almost like a foundation for for putting these apartments on top of. I think it's very much about sort of this idea of having some extra apartments. Doesn't need to be. You know, in a certain way, there's there's way of expanding that universe. So the car park is sort of elevating all these 80 flats up, and all of them has almost like a hundred square meters of garden in front. The apartments is facing this terrace, and then you have this peak sticking out. So every apartment in the project have 180 view of uh, Copenhagen city in front of them. As you can see, it's uh, quite a huge roof. All of the water which is falling on the building itself is collected in a big tank. And if it stays dry for a few weeks, the plants grow without adding water from the outside. Self-sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> nice. We can go and see if you want. I would love to. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. These are 260 parking spots. And they're all, all sort of laid out as this mountain slope. You can even sort of, you have this mountain path coming all the way up. Um, and then in the middle of the building, there's this sort of inclined elevator taking you up to the floor that you want to go to. It was quite a nice idea that people could relate directly to a floor just by the color itself. Basically, every room is sort of oriented towards this uh, terrace uh, in the middle of the house. It almost becomes like this extra living room of your own home. Here you have complete uh, sort of privacy, and uh, if we move further out, you become the part of this sort of uh, the urban garden. And now we are on the sixth floor, and I think today uh, we can almost uh, see Sweden in the background. À la jonction de la ville et de la campagne, on arrive à la spectaculaire Eight House, la bâtisse en huit. Parfaitement intégrée à la réalité copenhagoise, il est facile de se rendre au sommet de cet immeuble résidentiel de 10 étages sans ne jamais descendre de son vélo. It's not like Tour de France or anything, but uh, you need some power in the legs. Well, it's the first time I've biked up a building. Let's just say that. <laughs> I have to admit, I've never seen anything quite like this in my whole life. As you can see, we are sort of on ninth floor. We were able to bike up. All the elevators has been dimensioned so that you can bring in your bike. Uh, and the mailman can sort of bring his mail to right to your front porch uh, just by bringing his bike up here. What was amazing when we were biking up is that people were sitting on their terraces, which are on a slope and basically having a drink and playing with the kids. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a little community here. Yeah, it is. But, but I think that's also one of the sort of the very uh, uh, positive things about uh, the outcome of this building is that people actually uh, stay in their front uh, yard and, be, and, and sort of take part in this uh, community all the way to the 10th floor. So, so it's, uh, it's almost like we are, are putting all the, the layers of a, of a dense city on top of each other and creating this, uh, this uh, small community out here. Le Eight House propose une version ultra-moderne d'un concept britannique qu'on retrouve encore à Copenhague. Les rangs de patates, comme on les appelle ici, sont des rues résidentielles très étroites qui permettent une vie communautaire unique grâce à leur petite taille et leur cours avant. Projeté dans un concept en hauteur, ça donne ceci. 
It has 630 flats, so it, it is becoming a little community and you can say, see that the people are taking a, a small walk on the, on the facades of the building. And you have a pasture yes, over uh, here with cows yes, grazing. Exactly. And basically this will not change, this is a conserved no. area? Yes, it, it's, it's part of sort of a, a future Copenhagen that will never change. À Copenhague, tout est pensé pour rendre la vie encore plus agréable. Et selon les sondages, les Danois sont les gens les plus heureux du monde, même s'ils font face à une réalité financière plutôt imposante. Les conférences que donne la sociologue Emilia Van Huen à travers le monde portent sur le bien-être danois. Avec elle, je tente de cerner ce qui rend la vie si paisible ici. Copenhagen keeps getting ranked number one in the world in surveys about happiness and well-being. Why? <laughs> yeah, because we have a welfare system that works very good, and um, we have the highest degree of women uh, working in the world, and that makes a very equal society too. Then we have a very high degree of uh, education, and, and people think they have a kind of uh, responsibility to be happy themselves and uh, that's what they try to do. There's a lot of factors that makes you feel secure and that means that you don't have to, to preoccupy about a lot of things uh, if, if your life is not going the, the, the right direction and so forth because there's always someone to take care of you. If you don't have a job economically, there will always be some kind of help for you. They wanted to make a system secure for the people who really couldn't, who didn't have the measures and resources to do it. At the same time, we have this system that we support the young people who are studying. Uh, they get money from the state to be able to, to study instead of working. And everybody's allowed to the university. You don't pay any money to go to the university. And uh, it has made some kind of um, social uh, equalness. They have the right to enter the colleges to have some kind of other education. And, and that equals also our society, of course. Are you the most highly taxed country in Europe? Uh, not only in Europe, I think. We are, I think, the most highly taxed country in the world, yes. Vous avez bien compris. Le peuple le plus heureux du monde est aussi un des peuples les plus taxés du monde. Mais comment ces deux réalités peuvent-elles être compatibles? The cost of living in Denmark and in Copenhagen is very high. Yeah, and that's because we also have quite high salaries uh, compared to a lot of other countries. And of course, it has something to do with this uh, secure system that we have, the welfare system, that um, we earn a lot of money and we pay a lot of money of taxes to be sure that the whole society is actually working. And then, of course, we have very high costs for, for, for living. Uh, housing is expensive here? Housing is very expensive, but at the same time, housing is one of the most important issues for a Dane. People live very much in their houses. They invite each other to their houses. And a lot of people are living alone, too. We have a lot of uh, people who are maybe in, in relationships, but they, have, they keep their own apartment or their own house uh, instead of moving together. So we need a lot of houses in Denmark. C'est peut-être cette nature casanière qui explique l'état de bien-être quasi mantratique que les Danois recherchent. Le Hugues. There was one foreigner that, that said that the days are very strange. People, they light a candle and then they worship a god called Hugge. <laughs> and what you do is that you kind of, uh, you cozy together, you know, you get together and then lighting a candle, eating something nice, having, you know, uh, moving together and, and making a nice atmosphere, not discussing and debating or anything, but just, you know, cocooning together uh, in a way that the, out, you know, the outside world is not a part of it. If you have a Latin people who wants to debate, then he ruins the hygge. So hygge is like a feeling of well-being surrounded by family? Yeah, and secureness too, that you feel secure and, and it is a ritual. It is a ritual that we do. You, you can almost not hygge without uh, lighting candles, for instance. It's like when you light a candle, then you, you start the ritual of having a hygge. Une des expressions les plus marquantes de la quête locale du bien-être, la passion 
pour la nourriture de qualité. Copenhague est d'ailleurs la capitale mondiale de la consommation de nourriture bio. Klaus Mayer a été à la tête d'un important mouvement de conscientisation, puis d'un manifeste axé sur la redécouverte de la cuisine nordique dans la vie de tous les jours. La cuisine danoise est étroitement liée au climat. Il y a eu quelques moments de, de, de grande beauté, là, 1850, par là, mais on a tout perdu parce qu'on a commencé à suivre un peu le rythme de l'industrie et les prix. Alors, la nouvelle cuisine nordique, c'est la métaphore pour une transformation de notre culture culinaire où on revient un tout petit peu aux valeurs anciennes, mais où il y a aussi de l'innovation. Le plat qu'on mange doit représenter un peu le lieu et le temps. C'est-à-dire de célébrer euh, les cadeaux de la nature par à travers l'année. Et en fait, que la distance entre euh, la plante et le plat soit le moins possible. Ce n'est pas qu'on n'a pas le droit d'utiliser de la chaleur, mais si tout est transformé en n'importe quoi avec des produits chimiques et on ne reconnaît pas du tout la nature sur l'assiette, ce n'est pas la cuisine nordique. On goûte Oui, on goûte. Mmh. Mmh. Pas mal, hein Incroyable. C'est une sorte d'épinard sauvage. Euh, qu'on peut utiliser juste comme, euh, comme l'épinard, cru dans, dans une salade avec une vinaigrette avec de la crème, par exemple, crème fleurette avec euh, du, du vinaigre, de citre de pomme, c'est le poivre et une pointe de sucre. C'est extraordinaire. C'est la recette peut... secrète. C'est la recette... Euh, non, l'une des, des valeurs essentielles de la Mais cuisine non, nordique, c'est que rien n'est secrète. Tous nos idées, on les distribue à nos amis, suivant la philosophie que le plus on donne, le plus on reçoit. Alors c'est très différent de... Alors c'est le karma. C'est exactement. C'est un peu le karma. Un autre élément fondamental de la cuisine nordique, c'est qu'on veut redéfinir la notion de luxe. On adore le fait que le plus grand luxe du monde peut être le savoir-faire, c'est-à-dire la, la, la connaissance du fait qu'il y a cette plante-là qui est gratuite pour tout le monde. Mais il faut le savoir quand même. Il faut, il faut savoir où il est, il faut avoir le courage de le ramasser. Alors le temps d'aller dans le forêt, le ramasser, c'est le grand luxe. C'est-à-dire tout d'un coup, euh, les, grands, les grands plaisirs de la vie culinaire sont ouverts à tout le monde. Pour nous, un, un Oma, par exemple, l'un des plus grands plats qu'on qu qu fait peut être fait avec euh, une betterave. Ce n'est pas n'importe quel ingrédient que tout le monde peut ramasser gratuitement, n'importe où. La grande différence, c'est qu'on ne fait pas un effort pour mettre des matières premières très chères dans chaque plat. Euh, on a au minimum la moitié des plats à nos mains sont faits avec des matières premières très humbles. Et <rire> les gens adorent ça. Ils comprennent absolument sans problème du tout que la raison pour laquelle ça coûte euh, 150 euros euh, pour 12 plats, ce n'est pas, pas le coût. Parce que le point, ce n'est pas le coût de la matière première, c'est tout le soin, c'est le temps qu'on a mis pour y arriver, c'est l'empathie du saveur, c'est l'intérêt vis-à-vis des clients, c'est beaucoup d'autres choses là, qui, qui, qui constituent un moment extraordinaire dans un restaurant. On ne gagne pas le point en savant du caviar, c'est brut, c'est vulgaire. Ça, c'est bon. Le restaurant de Klaus, le Noma, s'est mérité le titre de meilleur restaurant au monde, selon le guide San Pellegrino, deux années de suite. Ce n'est qu'un guide, mais sept mois d'attente pour avoir le privilège d'y manger un repas, ça en dit beaucoup. Et pourtant, les plats extravagants que sert son chef René Redzepi rayonnent de simplicité. Les ingrédients de son menu proviennent en grande partie des jardins à proximité de la ville et de l'eau qui l'entoure. C'est une transformation profonde de notre société qui est en train de se faire. Le consommateur moderne se considère plutôt comme un coproducteur. Il est copilote. C'est lui qui prend en charge la situation. Regardez là. Nous, on a, on a loué ce champ, ces deux hectares, pour, pour produire nos propres légumes pour nos restaurants. Mais on a dit, dis donc, imagine qu'on avait une cinquantaine de particuliers qui avaient leur propre chardin. Mais est-ce que ça peut se faire On ne savait pas. Et alors, on a dit tout doucement dans notre homepage qu'on euh, pouvait louer un chardin 60 mètres carrés, avoir, euh, recevoir une, un entraînement, tout, un tout petit peu d'entraînement, et faire la fête euh, lorsqu'on récolte au mois de septembre. Et en moins de 36 heures, 
ces jardins étaient partis. Ils viennent deux fois par semaine de, de la station de Copenhague avec le bus ou le train, avec des instruments pour cultiver le jardin. Ils, ils travaillent le jardin. Au lieu d'aller au fitness, faire du jogging, ils font du jardin avec les enfants ou les grands-parents. L'idée de transformer notre cuisine en quelque chose de très beau et de unique sur le, monde, sur le plan mondial, on pensait que ça devait être la vision de notre société et non pas seulement de nous. Il y a pas mal de gens qui pensent que c'est une question d'exporter ou d'améliorer le tourisme. Mais on peut enlever le mot nordique et le remplacer par Canada ou Amérique du Nord ou même l'Amérique du Sud. Nourriture, urbanisation, architecture et transport. Tout à Copenhague est hyper fonctionnel, conçu pour rendre la vie plaisante. La ville a l'audace de foncer et de proposer au reste du monde une manière alternative et pratique de faire les choses. Elle encourage la vie familiale, donne la priorité aux piétons et se soucie de la sécurité des cyclistes. Qui sait, peut-être l'automobile sera-t-elle bientôt une chose du passé dans la capitale du vélo. Pour en connaître plus sur les villes visitées, rendez-vous sur port.tv5.ca. TV5 Monde sur TV5 Monde Plus.